this tape is being made for the kingdom of God as I am presenting it to Brother Lee Vale for a manuscript. Brother Vale has asked me here in the presence of Brother Mercer to, um, to give some of the former visions. Of course, visions were as... Uh, uh, the fir- one of the first things I can remember is visions coming. Visions come all the time. But after my conversion is where I think you were interested in, Brother Vale. Well, I remember after I was ordained in the church, the Baptist church, by Dr. Roy Davis here at Watt Street in Jeffersonville, where the church was at the time. I remember one outstanding vision, not over a few weeks after my about a, I'd say a few days after my ordination, I was uh, saw a vision of an old man that was laying in the hospital that was mashed. He was a colored man, and uh, he was uh, instantly healed, in so much that it caused a lot of confusion. And um, he got up out of the bed and walked away, and. Uh, uh, two days, about two days after that, I was uh, uh, cutting off services, uh, non-paid services in New Albany, water and gas and and electrical bills. And it, uh, I was so filled with joy every time I'd find an old house, I'd just go in and pray, you know, where no one lived. And uh, I remember telling Mr. Johnny Potts, which is living today, he's way close to, I guess, to 70 or 80 years old. He was an old meter reader. And they'd taken him off a of meter reading then and had placed him at the desk uh, to take complaints and things as he entered the door and uh, service calls. And I was telling him what the Lord had showed me. And uh, he had been uh, once in a while picking up a few stray meters that the regular man didn't get. And in this, he, um, he was telling a man, which I'd seen in the paper, where... They had a, an old wagon in those days, drove two horses to pick up garbage and trash in the alley. There's an old colored man by the name of Mr. Edward J. Uh, Merle. He lived at 1020 Clark Street in New Albany. And uh, he uh, had been hit by two white people, which was a white girl and a, and a boy riding in a car and he lost control of the car. And it mashed him into the wheel of the wagon, and it just broke all the bones in his body nearly. And they uh, threw his chest part especially, knocked his back out of place. And they had him in the hospital very bad. And Mr. Potts, passing through the, the hospital there in New Albany, had told him that, uh, about the Lord dealing with me. And he sent for me to come pray for him. And immediately I thought, that's the man that I have seen in this vision. So I, I was a little scared to go because that's one of my first, you see, to go like that. So, but however, I went and got my buddy, which had just been converted, a little French boy named George D'Arc. And I just led him to Christ. And uh, we went up and I said, now, uh, Brother George, I, I, I want you to remember these things that happened to me, I can't understand them. But you remember, this man's going to be healed. And when he's healed, he's, I can't pray for him till the two white people comes and stands on the other side of the bed. Because I have to do it the way it was showed to me. And I went in to, to the uh, hospital and asked for Mr. Merle. And I went there and his wife told me that he was very seriously and he couldn't move because that the x-rays had showed that some of these bones were laying right next to the lung. And if he moved, why, it would, might puncture his lungs and hemorrhage him to death. And uh, he was very bad, and it was hemorrhaging a little from his throat and so forth because he was bleeding around the mouth. He had been laying there about two days. And the man was at that time about 65 years old, I suppose, 60 or 65. Elderly man, his mustache long had turned white, and his hair was green. And I went in and told this man, oh, the vision I'd saw from the Lord, and the young people come in that it hit him. And I knelt down to pray for him, and all of a sudden this man let out a scream, saying, I'm healed, and jumped up. And his wife trying to hold him back in bed, and one of the interns came trying to hold him in bed, and he jumped out of the bed. It caused a lot of excitement, and when I went to the, I said to Brother George, and then one of the sisters is the Catholic hospital, 
come in and said, I'd have to get out of there. So uh, getting that man excited because he had a fever about 104. And the strange thing, when they put him back in uh, the uh, the priest of the place and the, some of the doctors that put him, made him go back to bed because he's putting on his clothes. And when they took his temperature, he had no temperature. There's many people living today that seen the vision, seen it happen, and know about it. And uh, I went out and stood on the steps and said to Brother George, now you watch, he's going to be wearing a brown coat and a plug hat. He'll walk right down these steps in a few minutes. And he actually did. He'd come right out and walk down. And about uh, uh, a night after that, the Lord appeared to me again one morning just about to break a day and showed me a woman hideously crippled that was going to be made well. So I said, well, I'll... Uh, I'll f probably find out where she's at. And uh, so um, uh, I went down and was turning off some water up on, I believe, around 8th Street in New Albany. And uh, I had to, there's a double tenement, and I was afraid I turned off both sides. One side, the people had moved out, and the other side, the people were there. So I went over to the side that had the, the people, is occupied, and I knocked at the door, and there was a, a, a real poor people and a very attractive young girl come to the door, rather poorly dressed. And um, she uh, she said, uh, uh, what did you want? And I said, uh, would you try the water to see if it's off? And she said, yes, sir. And she went, she said, no, the water's still on. I said, thank you. And her mother laying on bed, her name was Mrs. Mary Daryl Ohanian, and the, the, she was Armenian. Her boy played fullback, I believe it was, on the uh, New Albany Bass uh, football team. And she, her daughter was in high school. Her name was Dorothy. And she said, uh, Dorothy says to me, aren't you that man of God that have that healing here in the hospital of the day? My mother wished to speak to you. And I went in, and she told me that uh, she was laying crippled, and she had been crippled in the bed 17 years since this girl was born. And uh, so the girl was 17 years old, and so I told her that, she said, are you that man of God that healed that man? I said, no, ma'am, I'm not a healer. I just um, just merely uh, 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 pray for the this sick man was showed by something it told me. I didn't know what to call it, a vision or what. I didn't know what it was yet. I was just a boy and single and everything. And so there was um, this, um, this lady asked me for prayer for her. And I told her, let me pray first. And then if the Lord showed me to come back. And then when I went out to pray, I got Brother George and I said, that's that woman that I, I was telling you that I prayed about. I know it's the same woman. Go with me. And we went up there to, to offer prayer. And so this little 17-year-old girl, of course, me, just a young boy, and she had a brother about six, eight years old, something like that. And there's a Christmas tree. It's right after Christmas, standing in the house. And they got behind this Christmas tree to laugh at me to make their mother well. I told her that the Lord was going to heal her. And I, Brother George and I got down to pray. And when I started to pray, well, that angel that I see that, that you see in the picture. I seen it hanging over the bed. Well, I reached over and took a hold of her hand. And I said, Mrs. Ohania. Now, she lives in New Albany right now, her and her husband and family. And I said, Mrs. Ohania, the Lord Jesus has sent me and told me before coming that to pray for you and you's go be made well. Rise up on your feet and be made well in the name of Jesus. Her legs was drawn up under her. She, with the Armenian Bible over her heart, started moving towards the side of the bed. And as she did, she uh, then Satan spoke to me, said, You let her hit that floor, she'll break her neck off that high bed. I was scared for a moment. And I'd always know that what them visions, I didn't know what it was then, had told me was always right. So I went ahead anyhow, let her come off the bed, and God being my witness, as soon as she started to jump from that bed, both legs come straight. Her daughter screamed, pulling her hair and running out into the street, screaming as loud as she could. Neighbors come from everywhere. And there she was for the first time for 17 years, walking around in that room praising God. 
I left immediately to get away from it. Later, I got acquainted with this young girl and went with her. Of course, this don't have to be on record, but I went with the young girl. Uh, not long after that, a uh, few weeks, I was in my mother's house one evening. And uh, I'd been praying that day, and I, I just simply couldn't seem to break through to, uh, to uh, uh, victory in my prayer. And uh, I thought I'd just stay all, you know, go ahead to bed. I was staying at home at that time. And so I went into the the room to to pray, and I was about 1 o'clock in the morning, I guess. And I uh, prayed, and all at once uh, I looked, and Mama, she used to take her clothes, just pile them in a chair. You know, we were real poor people. And I looked something white coming to me, and I thought I was looking at that chair closed. But it's that angel of the Lord, that, that cloud, you know. And it come over to where I was, and I'm... And I was standing in a room, a little, what we call a shotgun house, a little straight house, two rooms in it. And it had uh, red uh, wings coating up here for the side, you see. There's a little iron poster bed to my right side. There's a black-headed woman standing against the, the one room, went out into the kitchen. She's standing against that kitchen door, a weeping. There was a father standing to me and had brought me a baby that something had been laying on its little chest and one his left leg is wound around till it's laying up against its little body and the right leg wind by vice versa, both arms wound up too against his body, and his little body was twisted and wound up till it right here at his neck. And I wondered, what does this mean? And I looked sitting down to my left and there sat an old woman, uh, taking her glasses off and wiping them from tears or something on her glasses. To my right, on a red duofold, which was a match to the chair, sat a young, blonde-headed boy with curly hair, looking out the window. And I looked, standing way over to my right, and there stood in that angel of the Lord. And he said to me, Can this baby live? And I said, Sir, I don't know. He said, Lay your hands across it. It shall live. And I, I did. And the baby um, uh, had jumped down off the, out of the arms of the father, and the little right leg untwisted, and the right side untwisted, right arm untwisted. It made another step, and the other side untwisted. Made another step, and the other side untwisted. The body, middle part untwisted. And he put his little hands in mine and said, "Brother Branham, I'm perfectly whole." The little baby was wearing blue corduroy. Uh, coveralls or overhauls, little bibbed overhauls, and he had brown hair and a little bitty tiny mouth. And uh, then the angel of the Lord uh, told me he was taking me somewhere else, and I was carried way away. And he set me down by the side of an old graveyard and showed me the numbers on a tombstone near a church. And he said, this will be your directing place. He carried me into another place, and there was a, looked like it had been a little a town with about two stores in it, and one had a yellow front, yellow boarding on the walls. And uh, I walked up there, or stood there, and there was an old man coming out with a blue corduroy jacket on, or a blue jean jacket, and blue overhauls with a, co a yellow corduroy cap, and he had a big white mustache. He said, he'll show you the way. And the next time I come to, I saw, I was walking into a room, thought, following a rather heavy-set young woman. And as I entered the door, the figures in the paper on the wall were red. Up over the door had a sign, God bless our home. There's a big old brass poster bed laying to my right side and a chunk stove sitting at the left. And over in the corner lay a girl of about 15 years old and she'd had polio or something that had drawn her right leg up and her foot turned sideways and was drawn under, and she, um, and she looked like a boy. Only she had hair like a girl, and she had uh, a heart-shaped lips like a girl. And uh, he said to me, Can that girl walk? And I said, Sir, I do not know. He said, Go put your hands across her stomach. Then I thought it was a boy, sure enough, because he had me put my hands across her stomach. I did as he told me, and I heard somebody say, Praise the Lord. And I looked up, and when I did, this girl was raising up. 
And when she raised up the pajama she had on, her pajama leg come up and it showed a round knee like a girl's knee and not knotty, you know, like the boy's knee. And I knew it was a girl. And she had on her pajamas and she come walking to me combing her hair. She's blonde, combing her hair. The girl lives in Salem today, married and got three or four children. And um, her mother and father are still there also. And uh, so um, I, I, um, I come to. And I could hear somebody saying, Brother Branham, or Brother Bill. Oh, Brother Bill. And I, my mother was calling me. And I thought, I hear one one way of coming out of that vision, you know, kind of droggy. And I said, what do you want, Mom? And in the next room where she's sleeping. And she said, there's somebody knocking at your door. And I heard it, Brother Bill. And I opened the door. There's a man stepped in. His name was John Emil. He lives in Miami, Florida now. And he said, um, Brother Bill, you don't remember me. I said, uh, no, I don't believe I do. He said, you baptized me and my family. But said, I took a road that's wrong. He said, I killed a man here some time ago, hit him with a fist and broke his neck in a fight. He said, I've lost one of my little boys, the oldest one, and said, the youngest one is laying home dying now. And said, the doctor of uh, the city here had just left and said, the child has double pneumonia and it just barely can get its breath. And said, I, 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 I just, you come on my heart. And wonder if you'd come and have prayer with it. And said, now, as you know, I'm a cousin to Grim Snelling. Which Grim Snelling, the Reverend Grim Snelling now, had not become a minister at that time. A nice Christian boy. He said, he's my cousin. I'm going down to get him. Which lived uh, uh, about a half a mile from me uh, down in the city. And said, I'm going down to get him. And will you go up? I said, yes, Mr. Hamill, as soon as put my clothes on. And so he said, I'll take my car and take you up. And I said, all right. He said, as soon as I get grim. And I want you all to pray for the baby. And I said, all right. So then um, uh, I went to getting ready. And mother said, what was the matter? I said, there's a little baby to be healed. And so uh, she said, healed? And I said, yes, mother. And so uh, I said, I'll tell you more about it when I come back. So in a few moments, he knocked at the door. And Brother Graham was with him. We was going up here by what we know as the boat yard now, which was the old Howard shipyard at the time. I said, Mr. Hamill, do you, where do you live at now? He said, in above Utica. I said, you live in a little, uh, what we call shotgun house, little two room. Yes, sir. Sets on a hill. Yes, sir. He said. I said, your, your war, baseboard here is made out of tongue and groove and it's painted red. He said, that's right. I said, the little baby is laying in an iron poster bed. And he does have in the house, at least, a pair of blue corduroy overhauls. says he has them on. And I said, and the baby is teeny fella, about three years old. And he's also got a little teeny mouth, little bitty thin lips. And he's got light brown hair. He said, that's the truth. I said, Mrs. Emil is a black-headed woman. And in this room, you have a red duofel and a red chair. He said, was you ever there, Brother Branham? And I said, just a while ago. A while ago, he said. I said, yes. Well, he said, I never seen you. I said, no, it was spiritually. I said, Mr. Emil, you've heard me tell, if I baptize you, of things that happens. Me, me, I see things before it happens. He said, yes. He said, something like that happened to you, Brother Branham? I said, yes, and Mr. Emil. Ever what it was that told me has never told me a lie. Your baby is going to be healed when I get there. And he stopped the car, fell over the wheel, said, God be merciful to me. Take me back, old Lord. See, and I promise you to live for you the rest of my days if you're going to spare my baby's life. And there he gave his heart to Christ. We moved into the house, all excited about him, a soul being brought back to Christ. When we, when we went into the house, there laid everything just exactly the way it was, only the old woman wasn't there, excitable. So excited, I said, bring me the baby. And the baby just barely living. See, that winding up was a life gone out of the baby. It was just wound to hear its little throat. And I said, bring me the baby. Not waiting for the vision to fulfill. Brother Bailey, if this pad was supposed to be laying here, I can't say a word till that pad's laid there. See, it has to be just the way it showed me. 
So I said, bring me the baby. And the, uh, Daddy brought the baby to me, and I prayed for it, and it got worse. So I thought, now something. It really lost its breath, and they had to fight and shake and everything get breath in. I thought, now there's something wrong. And I happened to think, where's the old woman? That wasn't there yet. So they take the baby, laid it down, they're putting uh, stuff under its nose and everything, and crying the mother, screaming hysterically and everything. But the baby was just, just barely a breathing. I thought, well, through my... My stupidity, I have misused uh, the vision of God because I never waited on it, being so overexcited. By this, you can see, Brother Bill, why I wait. I don't care who tells me. I love you as my brother. But brother, don't ever try to tell me something to do when I, when I feel that I, I've got the will of the Lord. See, no matter how well it looks the other way, I'll wait for Him. See? And, and so I, um, I learned a lesson right here many, many, many years ago. And... Um, to do exactly what he says, and don't do it till he says it's ready to be done. The baby was fighting for breath. Now, I couldn't tell him what I'd done, but I just had to wait. And I thought, maybe grace will override it. Forgive me. Well, I went, sat down. They fought for life for the baby till daylight. When day began breaking, they thought the baby just go at any minute. Well, I sat there, and they kept asking me, Brother Branham, what must we do? Or Brother Bill, they called me. What must I do? I said, I don't know. See? I sat there with my head down saying, Lord, please forgive me. Well, and then it come daylight. Brother Grim Snelling had to go to work. So Mr. Hamill had to take him, and I know I had to leave the house. And yet Brother Grim was supposed to be sitting there because he's got blonde curly hair, as you know. He's supposed to be sitting on this duo for. So I was sitting there where Brother Grim was supposed to be sitting, but the old woman wasn't there. There's no old woman at the place. So I sat there, and so Brother Hamill got his coat on. Then I know if Brother Grim left, Hard to tell when he'd ever be back. See? And then I noticed even if the woman come, then I, Brother Graham wouldn't be there. So I see what kind of condition is in. And so Mr. Emil said, Brother Branham, do you want to go, or Brother Bill, do you want to go home? You want me to take you down home? I said, no, sir, I'll just wait if you don't mind. I hate to stay there in the house, just the baby and the mother and myself, because they were young people. They, he was about 25 years old, I suppose. And I was about the same age. And I said, no, I'll just, uh, I'll just uh, wait, if you don't mind. He said, it's all right, Brother, Brother Bill. And so uh, the mother walked in the floor hysterically and trying to, crying and everything, you know, and the baby's just worse, see. Just looked like any minute, just kind of catching his breath like he's going, <coughs> that's all his breath is in it. And nothing, they didn't have penicillin and things them days, you see, so it's just... They just put plasters on them and things like that, but the little baby had had it for several days and it was gone, see, or going. And then um, I uh, I sat down there and I thought, my, if Grim go, Grim got his coat on and he started to go out the door and he said to his wife, he said, now we'll be back just a minute. And I thought, oh God, then I'll have to stay here all day, maybe all night again, see, waiting for that vision. What can I do? And I looked out the window and coming around the house come the baby's grandmother in there. But I didn't learn later it was the grandmother and she had on glasses. I thought, this is it, Lord, if, if Grimace don't go out the door. So she always come to the front door. But somehow, they don't even know to yet. But she went to the back door to come in the kitchen. And she walked in the kitchen, the little old house. And as she got to the door, her daughter ran over there and kissed her because it was the daughter's mother, you know. And kissed her and Brother Grim. And then she said, is the baby better? She said, Mother, it's dying. And she started screaming like that. And her mother crying. Then... I thought, if this will just work, now Grim don't go out, and I raised up, and it couldn't say nothing, you see, just wait, and Brother Grim walked around, I got up so he could sit down, and he walked, and that was some of his relation, you see, so he just started crying too, and sat down on the duo where he was supposed to be sitting, I thought, now, if that old lady will just come around and sit down in this red chair, and I got back to the door where Mr. Hamill was standing with his overcoat on and ready to go out, real cold weather, blizzardy cold, and I thought, and the old lady sat down in this chair, and Grim sat down and ducked his head down. And the mother of the baby put her hand up on the door and began weeping. Just exactly the vision. And the old lady sat down and instead of it being tears all together on her glasses, coming from the cold, it fogged them. And she reached in her little briefcase and got a little handkerchief out, and st or a little satchel, and started wiping these glasses. Brother, that was it. I said to Mr. Emil, I said, Mr. Emil, you still have confidence in me as a servant of Christ. He said, I sure do, Brother Branham. I said, I can tell you now. I spoke ahead of the vision a while ago. That's why it didn't happen. If you still got confidence in me, 
go bring me your baby. Oh, my. I see it was right then. You see, go bring me your baby. He said, I'll do anything you tell me to do, Brother Bill. I won't be afraid to pick it up. Because when he picked it up, it just went to breath all together. Left it. Brought the little baby up to me, reaching God in his arms. Brought it up to me and stood there. I put my hand on and said, Lord, forgive the stupidity of your servant. See, I spoke ahead of your vision. But now let it be known that you're a God of heavens and earth. No more said that. The little baby threw both arms around his daddy and began screaming and crying. He said, Daddy, I feel all right now. See, I said, Mr. Hamill, let the little baby alone. It'll be three days before it leaves it because it made three steps unwinding. I went home. I told it in my church. I said, I'm going back as on Monday. I said, Wednesday night before church, I'm going up there. There's poor people, and we made them up a basket of groceries to take to them. So I said, I want you all to go. And when I go there and you get around the house, and when I come to that place to where that house is, you watch and see if that little baby don't come across the floor with a little mustache made here where he's been drinking chocolate milk or something, you see, and put his hands in mine and say these words, Brother Bill, I'm perfectly whole, this little three-year-old baby. Watch and see if it don't happen. My wife now, Mita, way before we were married, so she was in the bunch. And a truckload went and placed themselves around the house, see, to see me when I drove up. And the old public service company truck that I had home that night, I didn't have any car of my own, full of tar in the back and things, you know, where I'd been hauling it that day and fixing things. Drove up in front, stopped, went up on the porch, knocked on the door, and they didn't have no rugs on the little old floor. And the mother come across the floor and said, Why, it's Brother Bill! Like that, and the people were looking at the windows at the time to see what would happen. And in the corner playing was this little boy the third day. I stopped, never said a word, and he comes strolling across the floor. Put his little hands up in mine with a little, been drinking chocolate milk, his little mustache like a cross there from the chocolate milk. Put his hands up in mine. Said, Brother Bill, I'm perfectly whole. And that night at the church I told it, I said, there's a cripple girl somewhere that's needy. I said, church, I don't know what these things mean. I can't tell you. And, and so I was working at the public service, and I remember one day, about a week after that, I started to leave the building, going out. Mr. Herb Scott lives here in the city right now. He was my boss. And he said, uh, I started down, he said, Billy. And I said, yeah. I said, before you leave, I've got a letter here for you. I said, okay, Herbie, I'll pick it up in a minute. And, uh, and so I went over to get uh, my other work. I was checking up. So I went over to get my other work done. And um, when I, I did, I remember that letter. And I went and got it and opened it up and said, Dear Mr. Branham, see, said, my name is Nail. I'm Mrs. Harold Nail. We live at a place called South Boston and said, we're Methodists by faith. And I happened to read a little book that you wrote called Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, a little pamphlet. And we were having prayer meeting in our house the other night. And we have heard of you having success praying for the sick and said, I have an afflicted daughter, 15 years old, said that's uh, laying on the bed of affliction. And somehow I just can't get it off my mind that I should have you to come pray for this girl. Would you please do it? Yours truly, Mrs. Harold Nail, South Boston, Indiana. I said, you know, that's the girl. That's her. I went home, told my mother, told him about it. I said, that's, that's the girl. And then that night at church, I said uh, uh, to the church, I said, uh, here's that, le that, that, that place. I said, Anybody know where South Boston is? And Brother George Wright, you all are acquainted with him. He said, Brother Branham, it's, I think it's down the south. So the next day, uh, I, two friends of mine and the, my wife, which now is, and a man and his wife from Texas, na uh, their name was uh, Brace, Ad Brace. He lives down here now in below Milltown, farmer. He was a rancher out in the west, and he had moved here to be close to the church. And um, I'd prayed for his wife, and she had been healed of a tubercular condition. And so he wanted to see this happen. I said, you go with me and see if it don't happen just this way. So the lady had never seen a vision, Mrs. Mrs. Brace. So my wife went with me, and Brother Jim Wiseheart, the old elder, you remember the church, said the old deacon, he wanted to sit. And I just had a little old roadster then, and I piled them all in there. And we went down below New Albany, and I found this sign. And I come to find out it wasn't South Boston, it was New Boston. So then I didn't know where to go. So I come back up to Jeffersonville and asked somebody. And somebody went to the post office and they said, South Boston, 
is up above Henryville. So I, I went up to Henryville and I asked there and they said, turn off on this road. It's about 15 miles back over these knobs here. You find a little place, you'll be careful, you'll miss it. said, because it's just one little store and the store's got the post office and everything else in it. South Boston. Over in these knobs. These 17,000 acres of them knobs in there, you see. And this is over behind it in the hills there. So we went on riding along and all at once I felt real strange. After I'd been driving five or six miles, and I felt real strange. And I said, I don't know. They said, what's the matter? I said, I believe that that one that talks to me wants to talk to me, so I'm going to have to leave the car. So I got out of the car, and the women sitting on women's laps, you know, and everything, that little old roadster. And I got out of the car and went around behind the car. And I bowed my head down, put my foot up on the bumper in the back of the car. And I said, Heavenly Father, what would you have your servant know? And I prayed. Nothing happened. I waited a few minutes, and... I thought, well, uh, he, usually where there's a crowd like that, I have to get to myself. And so I waited a few minutes. And I happened to be attracted to look over there. And I happened to think, well, look here. Here's that old church sitting down here. And if you ever at it, it's a Bunker Hill Church. And I looked over on the side of Bunker Hill Christian Church. And there was a tombstone of the graveyard right in front of the church. And I went over there. I said, now, you all got them letters. I've never been in that country before in my life. Never was in above there anywhere in my life. And I said, you get them names and numbers and come over here and see if there ain't the same one on this tombstone. And there it was, just exactly. I said, that's it. We're on the right road now. I said, as the angel Lord, see, I passed right on by it and not know it. So, oh, he's perfect. And so we rode on and on. Directly I met a man and I said, could you tell me where South Boston is, sir? He said, you jog to the right and the left and, you know, so forth like that. And we just kept on going. So after a while, we come into, I noticed I come into a little place and it had a kind of a little village like and I I looked, I said, that's it. That's it right there. I said, there is the, uh, there, there's that yellow storefront. And I said, now you watch. A man is going to come out of there with a the blue overhauls on, a white corduroy, a yellow corduroy cap with a white mustache, and tell me where to go. If it ain't, I'm a big storyteller. And so there's all waiting. And, and I drove up in front of the place, and just as I drove in front, out come the man with a blue overhaul suit on, and the yellow corduroy cap and the white mustache. And Mrs. Brace fainted in the car. It, seen it come to pass like that. And I said, Sir, you're to tell me where Harold Nail is. He said, Yes, sir. I said, Did you come from the south? I said, Yes, sir. He said, You passed it about a half mile down the road. You turn the first road to the left. You go up and you find a big red barn and you turn in there at that red barn. He said, It's the second house on your right as you turn up that little lane like road. I said, Yes, sir. He said, Why? I said, He has an afflicted daughter, does he? He said, Yes, sir, he does. I said, The Lord is going to heal her. And the old man started crying. Thing. He never knew. And so he's included in the vision. He didn't know what was going on. I turned around. We got Miss Nail kind of revived again. And went up there. Walked up into the yard. Got out of the car. Started in. Started up the place to the, you know, to the place where it was at. And um, a heavy set young woman come to the door. I said, there she is. See? And so she said, how do you do? And I said, how do you do? I said, I'm, I'm uh, Brother Bill. Oh, she said, I, I, I thought you were. She said, you got my letter? I said, yes, ma'am, I did. She said, I'm Mrs. Harold Nail. I said, well, I'm glad to know you, Mrs. Nail, and this is just a little party. Come with me to pray for your girl. I said, yes. I said, she's fixing to be healed. She said, what? And her lips started quivering. And she started crying. I said, yes, ma'am. And I, I don't know. I never stopped for the woman. I walked right on down the hall, and my party followed me. When I opened the door to the right of the hall, big old country home, opened the door, there was the yellow news, the yellow papers on the wall, red figures, the sign, God bless our home, the old brass poster bed, chunk stove sitting to my left, and there's a little bitty cot sitting there with this boyish looking girls laying in it. Now something happened. I was up in the corner of the room watching my body go to that bed. And I laid my hands right across her stomach, exactly the way the Lord said. And when I did that, when Miss Nail walked in the room and seen that, down she went on the floor again, fainted. She's kind of a weakly person. And she fainted on the floor again. And uh, Brother Nail was trying to work with her. And old Brother Jim standing there saying, Bless the Lord, holding his hands together, if you all knew how he acted. And um, so then uh, I looked at that, and I seen that. And I laid my hands up on her, or across her stomach like this. And I said, Lord, I do this at the command of what I think is God telling me to do it. And about that time, she started crying. 
And she jumped up and they just got Miss Nail to her feet. She'd woke up from her fainting spell. And when the girl jumped from the bed, there come her pajama leg up on the right leg, just exactly the way that it showed in the vision. And there was that round knee of a girl instead of a boy, and down went Miss Nail again. <laughs> See, she painted that the three times she'd fainted. And that girl walked out of there in that room and went into her dressing room weeping and put on her kimono, come walking back combing her hair. With her, with that, and her, her one hand was paralyzed too on the right side, combing her hair with that crippled hand. She's married, got a bunch of children. Her name, I don't know what her name is now, but nails. Anybody could tell you, Harold Nail. And that visions are true. I could place that and take you to people that would make a volume of books of such things that happen. Now that's true, brother Dale. I'll fail. I'm a man. I'm a failure to begin with and a very poor substitute for a servant of Christ. Brogan. M-E-R-R-E-L-L. I thought it was that damn narrow down. Is that all the names we use now? Mail with N-E-I-L. N-A-I-L. Brace, B-R-E-C-E. B-R-A-C-E. Add, add, brace. And I think I've got them all. Uh, just a minute. Graham Schilling. Uh, Graham, G-R-A-H-A-M-N-E-L-L-I-N-G. Oh, Schilling. Yeah, we got it.